Hello everyone, hope all of you are doing well. So this is a visual demonstration of laparoscopic TAP plus procedure for right iliac fossa incisional hernia. So right iliac fossa incisional hernia is basically categorized into the lateral hernias. Lateral hernias can be classified according to the ages classification L1, 2, 3, 4. And right iliac fossa hernias are categorized into L3. And according to uh, the size criteria, this is a W2 defect between 4 to 10 cm. So this, 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 for this particular patient, the size was 5 cm. So these are my port position, just a left paraumbilical camera port 10 mm. And uh, rest of the two ports are uh, right and left and working ports, maintaining the triangulation. And you can see the TA scar. So patient had uh, a total abdominal hysterectomy, I think 10 years back following which she gradually developed a swelling over the right iliac fossa and uh, now uh, there is a peak hernia you can see the omentum uh, is mainly the uh, content of the hernia there were small bubbles but they, uh, after inflating the abdomen with uh, CO2 the small bubble fell inside the abdomen uh, but uh, there is some additions with the uh, omentum uh, additions of the omentum with the hernial sac so uh, first thing is to after going inside uh, after confirming the finding is to reduce the hernial content so while reducing the hernial content you should take care you should not if you are planning for a tap plus procedure you should take care that you should not injure the peritoneum adjacent to the hernial defect and you be very careful uh, because uh, if you injure the peritoneum around it or inside the uh, hernial defect uh, so while you lift uh, the peritoneum for uh, tap, uh, then there will be a rinse, which uh, then you again have to close at the end of the procedure. So uh, just a uh, uh, good amount of traction and counter traction, trying to reduce all the fatty content, the momentum content uh, out of the hernial sac. And uh, after reducing, the just, uh, just uh, confirming my finding that hernial so as you can see it's uh, over the right iliac fossa around 5 cm by 4 cm defect and uh, now uh, from the uh, proximal border of the defect I am just scoring uh, the peritoneum with monopolar hook from where I will be lifting of the peritoneum so it's around 5 cm proximal to the upper border of the defect I mean the proximal border of the defect and now gradually uh, I am lifting uh, the peritoneum so you can see I'm using monopolar cautery gently. First, I'm with the tip of the instrument, I'm just tracking, uh, creating some space uh, between the peritoneum and the posterior rectus sheath, and then this little bit of energy application to divide the peritoneum. And while uh, doing this, you should take care that you should not injure the posterior rectus sheath and get, into, get in, uh, into the retractor space. It was just the peritoneum. And you can see while I'm coming down towards the, uh, just below the, yeah, and towards the pelvis, uh, it's uh, the fat content is more, while in the upper part the fat content is almost nil. So here the peritoneum is thin, but uh, with a good amount of traction with your left hand, uh, left hand instrument, uh, gentle traction, and uh, with uh, careful cauterization and dissection uh, with the back of the hook, you can uh, lift up the peritoneum nicely. There you may find some small uh, blood vessels uh, which can bleed, but if these are uh, easy to control. So you can see gradually I'm lifting the peritoneum of the posterior rectus sheath. Here. So along with the peritoneum, you should take the preperitoneal fat so that the uh, the flap becomes thicker and uh, you can uh, keep. Uh, good amount of uh, traction with your left hand instrument so gradually when you'll be going down uh, uh, following the line you will encounter the arcuate line so once you are below the arcuate line there is posterior uh, uh, is deficient to work there and you have good amount of fat in the post uh, in the pre-peritoneal region so the flap becomes thick, thicker and you can see I'm giving uh, traction with left hand instrument and uh, identifying the loose areolar tissue plane uh, between the posterior rectus sheath and the peritoneum. A little bit of uh, cauterization and pushing it with the back of the hook. 
So this step also can be done with uh, scissors, uh, cold scissor. But uh, sometimes I do it cold scissor, but this time uh, I'm doing it with hook. So again, uh, energy application should be very uh, carefully done because active energy application can uh, injure the injury of your flap and uh, make some red. So you can see I'm gradually uh, in creating more space between the peritoneum and the posterior rectus sheath and just cauterizing and pushing it, identifying the plane, the correct plane. So here the flap creation is basically, uh, initial part is difficult, but once you are going lateral and uh, as you go lateral, uh, create uh, laterally, you will find more amount of fat coming into the pericardial region. Now, after uh, dissecting around the hernial defect, so I am now uh, trying to target the hernial sac. So, before embarking into hernial sac dissection, you should always uh, dissect all around the hernial defect as much as possible, so that you can have enough uh, space to venture uh, into this area. And you can see I am giving good amount of uh, traction with the steady traction with left hand instrument. And we, we also you have to be very gentle uh, while using your left hand instrument. An atraumatic uh, grasper is very helpful. I am using a middle end forceps. One can use soft atraumatic grasper also. And you can see I am pushing, pulling and pushing with both the instruments. So that I can get as much as hernial uh, sac, that is the peritoneum, into the flap side, so that uh, uh, ultimately it's an incisional hernia. So there will be some scarring, uh, and ultimately there will be a rent that I know there will be a rent in the peritoneal flap that I have to close. So I'm trying to buy as as much as peritoneum as possible from the sac part, so that while closing the defect. I'll find that, that there is enough peritoneum and there is after closure there won't be any shortage of uh, flap uh, coverage. So now I'm uh, making the uh, incision because beyond that I won't be able to uh, reach. So I'm dividing the peritoneum around the hernial ticket and I'm uh, under vision. I'm pulling the margin of the peritoneum and giving good amount of traction downwards. And following the hernial defect uh, border, I am just uh, encircling the peritoneal uh, rent following the hernial margin. So here also while lifting off the, uh, dividing the peritoneum, I am giving good amount of uh, traction with my left hand instrument so that I can bring some amount of peritoneum which is actually inside the hernial cavity so that I can uh, get a good amount of uh, uh, peritoneum uh, into the flap site. So you can see I am now going inside the hernial uh, cavity from where I am trying to dissect some peritoneum of the uh, abdominal wall so that I can uh, bring it inside, bring the peritoneum inside and that will help me in uh, closing the uh, peritoneal rate. So for me, I always believe like uh, the preperitoneal pain is the most physiological plane where you can place a mesh uh, while doing your hernia repair. And uh, if it is possible, uh, one should always try to do a preperitoneal repair, be it open or laparoscopic. Well, it is also it is uh, true that uh, TAP plus procedure is. Uh, not possible for each and every case and you should select your cases accordingly according to the uh, according to the patient profile the hernia, hernia characteristics of the hernia previous uh, history of uh, operation so uh, based on the multiple factor you should decide your uh, choice of hernia repair for a particular patient so case to case basis selection is very important so you can see now i am uh, i have uh, lifted up the peritoneum and now I am going beyond the hernial defect margin on the opposite side. 
so this is the distal border of the hernial uh, defect and now i am separating the preperitoneal fat from the lateral abdominal wall fat and uh, mobilizing the pectoral flap on the opposite aspect so you can see that i am i mean the almost all the dissection i have done in this case with the monopolar uh, cautery Traction, counter traction uh, is equally important uh, while doing laparoscopic, any laparoscopic surgeries. So, uh, lower down uh, on the medial aspect, it's uh, rectus muscle. Uh, you can see the reddish uh, rectus muscle. So, laterally, it's the right rectus, and the medially is, uh, uh, I mean, on the left, uh, left side of the screen uh, that is the uh, lateral abdominal wall and the right side of the screen there is uh, there are rectus muscle and uh, right and left rectus are uh, there together so gradually I am uh, I got all the peritoneum uh, adjacent to the hernia defect into my flap into the flap side and now I'm uh, now my uh, target would be uh, mobilize the peritoneum beyond the hernial defect uh, as much as possible so that I can place an adequate size of mesh after closing the defect. And here I'm going towards the right groin area. So you can see there is a very good amount of uh, preperitoneal and lateral abdominal wall fat over there and here the peritoneum is uh, thick also and loose also so that once you are uh, to entered into the groin the lifting of the peritoneum is much easier and here you can see that I am bringing all the fat down along with the flap so that muscle uh, both the recti are uh, there and also you should take care that there is uh, inferior epigastric vessels uh, uh, of the right side uh, underneath the right rectus muscle so here you cannot see my left hand instrument but my left hand instrument is part consistently giving a downward good amount of downward traction so here over the right groin i will encounter the round ligament the right side of round ligament so here you can see the peritoneal deflection and now I'm just uh, identifying the ground ligament and dividing it close to the peritoneal reflection so that there is less chance of injuring the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. And uh, once you have divided the round ligament, the uh, uh, peritoneum mobilization becomes much easier. And now I'm into slowly getting into the space of radius on the pelvic side yes. and uh, so if you are in a again if you are in a correct plane it's uh, dissection is all about identifying the correct plane I always believe that so you can see above uh, on the lateral aspect again just pulling it with my left hand instrument and dividing the fascia transversalis to be in the preperitoneal plane and uh, now you can see uh, I have done enough dissection on the lateral aspect coming medially and uh, just uh, finding some scar tissue due to previous uh, hysterectomy operation and just uh, dividing the tissue a little bit uh, at, at a time and you can see both the recti muscle uh, together in the midline and the defect is just lateral to the uh, right lateral I mean, uh, lateral border of the right rectus muscle So, after a certain point of time, you have to continuously 
assess uh, whether you have done enough dissection or not. You can see the arcuate line over there, and below that the uh, rectus, uh, the rectus is bare, and you can see the impaired gastric vessels at two o'clock at around one o'clock, two o'clock position. And uh, so what you can do is because the peritoneum is loose on the other side, and I mean on the lateral uh, side. So after a certain amount of mobilization, you have to assess whether you can close the defect and close the peritoneal flap freely without any tension. If you find it a little bit mobilization is part the required, you can do it because the peritoneum is loose here. So a good amount of traction with left hand and uh, counter traction can uh, buy you more amount of uh, peritoneum from the uh, groin. Mm, and that will help you ultimately in, in closing the uh, peritoneal flap and also the peritoneal rate so that good amount of you can see the lateral abdominal wall fat which is lying over the psoas muscle and la other lateral abdominal wall muscle is nicely sitting over that area uh, so that should not be excluded because beyond the behind the uh, this this fat there are multiple knobs uh, like in the inguinal in uh, lateral femoral cutaneous knobs so those knobs are protected by the fat now and see inside the hernial cavity you can see the large hernial cavity is there and the uh, arcuate line is visible with the rectus muscle in the gastric vessel peritoneal drain tall you can see and this is the space of red gs the space of bocros and uh, approximately also five centimeter uh, gone now the next step is to close the hernial defect so i'm using uh, 10 uh, VLOC suture, a non observable 10 VLOC suture, and starting from the proximal end, will go towards the pelvis gradually. And uh, defect closure uh, now I routinely use barb suture because I found it very useful while using uh, while closing the defect. Initially, I used to close the defect with the polyamide suture or polyene suture, but later. Uh, with uh, usage of these barbs which I found it uh, very useful and less time consuming. So while closing the defect I am taking one or two bites with a uh, hernial uh, sac so that I can obliterate the potential dead space of uh, serum formation. So chances of serum formation will be less if you uh, close the hernial defect along with the uh, hernial sac so closing closure closure of the defect hernial defect is an essential part of any hernia uh, repair in ventral excisional hernia so that uh, will uh, prevent number one uh, chance of serum formation number two there will be less chance of mesh migration and uh, pseudo hernia formation or uh, other complications uh, following hernia repair. And defect closure is always recommended. So, same as IPOM plus, where uh, the difference between the IPOM and IPOM plus is defect closure. Here, the same, I call it TAP plus as uh, the routine TAP for groin hernias. We don't close the defect, but here. We are closing the defect as we are doing incisional hernia with that procedure. So this is this, that's why I call it that plus and uh, gradually taking uh, bites uh, from the margins of the hernial defect, safeguarding the inferior epigastric vessel uh, just which is adjacent to the right rectus muscle and uh, first we take all the bites. Uh, and then we'll pull the suture. And this is one kind of cell blocking suture. Once you uh, once you pull the suture, it will automatically get uh, locked. Unidirectional spiral. This is spiral uh, spiral unidirectional pop suture. So now I'm taking the last bite that is beyond the defect. And we we'll pull the suture gradually to close the hernial defect. So I'm I'm closing I'm showing the uh, hernial defect closure 
uh, almost the entire uh, video as the this this is an important part of uh, any hernia surgery and a uh, lot of uh, surgeons have asked me how do you uh, close the defect what suture what are the techniques why it is important so i'm trying to explain this video that uh, uh, why uh, defect closure is very important and how it should be closed and uh, what can be the possible advantages of defect closure in uh, hernia repairs, particularly in uh, this kind of hernia, and why it is very, very important to learn laparoscopic suturing that gives you a different degree of freedom. And I think all the uh, laparoscopic surgeons or aspiring laparoscopic surgeons who want to pursue uh, advanced laparoscopic surgery should always learn uh, laparoscopic suturing. So now, after reaching, uh, starting from one end, going to the distal end, and then coming back to the uh, point from where I have started. So I'm coming back with uh, the same suture, and so making it a two-layer repair. So we'll come back from the lower end, and uh, we'll come back up to the point from where I have started, and we'll stop there. that will keep a good uh, closure so while uh, closing the uh, any hernial defect you should decrease the pressure of the pneumoperitoneum at, at this point of time uh, this step particularly in this step hernial defect closure I have decreased the pneumoperitoneum up to 8 millimeter of mercury or 10 millimeter mercury uh, and it will help in uh, defect closure nicely and uh, you should always decrease your pneumoperitoneum uh, one uh, till you close the defect and then you can again uh, before the next step you can increase the pneumoperitoneum and pneumo pressure so after closing the uh, hernial defect now i am uh, closing the uh, peritoneal drain and now i am using the uh, simple uh, 20 pda suture so PDS uh, in this uh, case is, uh, is very handy because handling PDS is very easy. It will pass uh, smoothly uh, through the uh, tissues. And uh, initially I used to close it uh, with the uh, white grip, but uh, later uh, after starting the closure with uh, PDS, I found it very useful. And now I routinely close uh, uh, the peritoneal reins and close the peritoneum with uh, 20 PDS. So you can what is what I uh, felt during the closure. The initially I was closing the peritoneal rate from the inside of the pocket. Later I found that once I'm going uh, down, uh, I found it it is ergonomically easier uh, to close the peritoneum from the outside the pocket. So I came outside with the same suture and uh, finishing the uh, peritoneal rate closer. So no part of the mesh should be exposed. And now. I'm placing a 15 by 15 uh, centimeter regular uh, medium weight polypropylene mesh and uh, this is just routine uh, polypropylene mesh that in use and uh, I have trimmed it on the all, all the kernels because the area you have dissected is a rounded area and uh, I have uh, made all the margins uh, all the corners rounded so that the mesh fits nicely over that area and uh, I can accommodate the mesh nicely so you can see I am placing the mesh adjusting the mesh over that area I uh, should take care that no part of the mesh should uh, be uh, folded by the uh, peritoneal reflection so if you have done enough uh, dissection and you can uh, very easily uh, adjust one large enough mesh 15 by 15 centimeter mesh with at least 5 to uh, 6 centimeter coverage all around the defect and uh, here you can see the mesh is nicely sitting without any undue folding and that should be the uh, ideal uh, closure and now I am just uh, fixing the mesh with the same 20 PDS suture so I will give uh, I'll, uh, I'll do 4 to 5 point fixation here uh, it is on the proximal margin 
and I'll give you other uh, point fixation uh, on the with the posterior rectus sheath. Although it's a preperitoneal space, once you deflect the neoperitoneum, the mesh will sit on that area only, and there is, there is very less chance of mesh migration or mesh crumpling. But still, as the area that I dissected is large, uh, so I decided to put a few stitches to keep the mesh intact over that area. That's it. I have uh, fixed it, uh, fixed it the mesh nicely, and you can see the mesh is sitting nicely over that area without any folding. Just to see whether uh, all uh, the mesh is properly tucked, and there is no uh, undue folding of the mesh over the lower part. And now the last uh, step of the operation is to close the uh, approximate the peritoneal margin. Uh, so you can see I am uh, using the same 2-0 PDA suture to close the uh, approximate the peritoneal margin to close the peritoneal uh, flap. Here again this step can be done the mesh fixation and the uh, peritoneal flap closure could have been done by uh, tackers but uh, again if you use tacker there will be uh, more post-operative pain and also uh, it will be uh, costing more to the patient while I am using this simple 2-0 PDA suture it will keep a painless post-operative recovery number one and number two the cost of the operation will be much much less uh, than using the track attacker so you can see I am uh, taking a few throws of uh, PDS uh, through the peritoneum and then I will pull uh, so three four uh, bites and then we will pull the suture so that I should come and sit nicely so people uh, uh, I have seen surgeons closing the peritoneal flap with bob suture but uh, I think uh, peritoneal rain closer with bob suture is a bit uh, is uh, not necessary I felt because uh, it can be easily closed by PDS and uh, again the cost issues are there and the bob sutures has its own uh, side effects where the mesh uh, I mean the bowel can get entangled with the uh, uh, bobbed thread and can cause post-operative uh, intestinal obstruction. I have seen videos in YouTube and Facebook page people sharing this. That's a complication of bob suture. So that is uh, done. So I close the peritoneal end and now under vision gradually deflecting the neoperitoneum. So that uh, completes the procedure. The operation took time around 120 minutes and the patient was discharged on first post-op day. And the uh, patient is doing well in the post-operative period. Patient is came for a visit. There is no seroma. And uh, that's it. Here's uh, my preferred approach for lateral hernias. And uh, this is the post-operative uh, picture. You can see the three ports, and uh, the TA scar is visible. There is apparently no bulge on the right side now. And greetings uh, from my hospital where I work, Rubijayal Hospital, Kolkata. And uh, thank you very much uh, for watching my videos. Do subscribe to see more videos.